So I'm here to talk to you about my Glide library. It's an image manipulation library. Um, just a, another side note before I get going. On the uh, program, it shows the, uh, it shows the, talk as, the talk title as a deep dive into image manipulations with Glide. Uh, that's different than what you're seeing here, and that's because that title is actually for my tutorial slash workshop version of this talk, which is meant to be two or three hours long, which is obviously not gonna work. So this is actually the shorter version of it. So that's why the title here is a little bit different. So first, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's Jonathan, I'm from Canada. I'm a software developer, naturally. Uh, I've been writing PHP for about 15 years, so my whole career. Uh, for 10 of those years, I worked at a marketing agency, uh, but this year I actually went out on my own and started doing contract development. Uh, I'm also pretty active in open source, or at least I try to be. Uh, most of my open source work is done with a project called the PHP League, also known as the League of Extraordinary Packages. Um, I'm hoping some of you have heard of it. I've contributed a couple projects myself, one being Glide, the one I'm talking about, and the other one being Plates, with the, which is a templating library. I'm also on the leadership group there. Just one note about this talk before we go any further. A bunch of the stuff that I'm gonna be showing you is meant for, is gonna be features that are found in the next release of Glide, so Glide version 1.0. So I'm currently at 0.3, but I kinda of wanna give you a taste of some of the stuff that's coming. It's actually done, basically. I'm just like finalizing my tests and you know I gotta get a, patch the version and get it out. But uh, a bunch of people are already using it and it's, uh, it's been going pretty awesome. So I hope to have version one out by, you know, before the year's out. So what exactly is Glide? Glide is an image manipulation library uh, and it has two goals. One goal is on-demand images. So I wanna do on-demand image processing. So not something that you do beforehand, but the second you request an image, it generates it for you. And the other big goal is I wanted a ridiculously easy API, and I wanted that API to be HTTP based. So Glide basically works like this. It's not an alternative to GD or Image Magic, and it's also not even an, an alternative to uh, the Intervention Library, if anybody's familiar with that. The, the other big one in the PHP space is uh, Imagine. So the way it works is Glide actually sits on top of Intervention, and Intervention then is an abstraction between uh, GD and Image Magic. So you can actually use GD or Image Magic if you're using Glide. Uh, Glide, as I said, has an HTT based API. So you configure the whole piece in PHP, but then you actually access it using HTTP. HTTP. Uh, and you do that by passing in your image manipulation arguments as get variables. Uh, so what you, act, you act, basically end up with very little image manipulation code actually written in PHP itself. So I'll give you a few quick examples here. I won't spend too much time on the API itself. It's pretty well documented uh, at glide.thephpleague.com. Um, but just to give you a sense of how this works. So consider you have an image called kayaks.jpg and you wanna do something with it. With Glide, you would pass through width equals W for width equals 800 and it's gonna automatically resize that image the second you request it. Uh, notice, yeah, obviously you're passing through, the, it gets the name from the URL, so, and it gets the argument, the manipulation argument from the get variable. So pretty standard HTTP stuff. Uh, but you can go further with it if you wanted to resize it to constrain it to 800 by 6 or 800 by 500, you just pass in the height as well, and then by default, Glide will constrain it to those sizes. But there's a, a whole bunch of other fit methods as well. Uh, for example, the crop method. So here we're resizing to 600 by 600 and we say fit equals crop and it's automatically doing that for us. And then if we wanted to center it, you know, do the crop, this is by default centers uh, crops to the center, but if you wanted to crop it say on the left hand side, then you would just do crop left and it would automatically do that and you can do crop, crop right and a bunch of different gravity settings. Um, you can also do borders. So this is a new feature in one, version one which is pretty cool because it supports relative and fixed board border sizes. Um, because with Glide, you may not always know, depending on how dynamic your content is, you may not always know the width. You can actually say, I want this border to be 5% of the overall width of the image, or you can say, no, I want it to always be 10 pixels or, or whatever. And then there's also a bunch of settings about how it can actually be displayed, whether or not it's overlaid or it's, it goes around the image or the image actually shrinks to fit the border. Uh, <clears throat> that's, and you can even change the, obviously change the colors and the opacity of the border. 
supports watermarks, and there's a whole slew of features around watermarking, where, where it sits on the image, how big it is, um, uh, the padding it is from the edge. That's another new feature in version one. A lot of people had asked me for that one. And, and it does some other kind of more edge case stuff, uh, like some uh, effects, blurring is what I'm showing here, and pixelation, and it'll do filters like grayscale and sepia. And then of course you can encode it a bunch of different ways as well. So you can do JPEG, you can do uh, PNG, you can do progressive PNG, you can do, uh, or sorry, you can do G GIF, PNG, JPEG, progressive JPEG, and then if you're using a JPEG image, then you can also pass through the quality as well. So by default, I believe the quality is set to 90, which I believe is a bump up from the GD default. Uh, but anyway, so you can control all that stuff as well. All right, so where did this idea come from? Who here ever used the library Tim, Tim Thumb? Does anybody, does that ring a bell to anybody? Okay, well, no, no, it's an older project, so that doesn't really surprise me. It was basically this library that you, it did sort of the same thing, but you actually had to include a separate file for it, and you'd put that actual PHP file in your public root in your image directory, and it would do all this sort of stuff. And it, it was kind of, it got really popular, but it kind of fell apart because there was a bunch of security issues around it. So this is like a newer version of that, and it's, it uses modern day programming tactics, techniques, uh, it's installed via Composer. You don't actually have a separate file. It actually goes through your normal framework request cycle, so it goes within your routes. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, the same idea, but a much newer version of that. It was, uh, but actually, Tim Thumb wasn't where I got the idea from. I got the idea from a couple uh, cloud image services, uh, one called Cloud Inery. So this, this was a service I had been using for a project of mine, and I, I just really liked how these services worked. Basically what you did is you took your images for your application, you'd upload them to some you know, Amazon S3 bucket, and then you'd say, th the service itself would give you a URL, and you would just request your images, and it would go and find them on S3, and then do the, the resizing. And it did the resizing using HTTP as well. So the second one I stumbled on was Imagex, which this was one that I really liked because the API just made a lot of sense to me. Uh, so, and this actually is a service I still use, but for a lot of my smaller projects to pay for one of these services didn't really make sense. Um, I wanted that sort of functionality, but it, you know, for a small little site or even a medium sized site, depending on kind of the use case, um, I wanted the ability to do this on my own. And I knew that I could, so I put it together, and, and that's kind of how Glide came about. Um, a lot of the Glide API is actually based on the ImageX API, because I think they've done such, a, such an awesome job with it. So as mentioned, you uh, upload your images, and you save, your, um, you save your original images only. You don't save your manipulated images. And this is really handy. Because what, what it is, it basically feature proofs you because you get your images from your user and you save the source image and you can save that on your local disk and you can save that on the S3 or whatever, which I'll touch on in a minute. minute. Um, but you don't actually save the manipulated version. You just keep the original and then when you want a manipulated version, you request it using HTTP. Um, so this is, this is nice because you don't need to know your sizes ahead of time. So if you're, this is, uh, I've been bitten with this so many times. You have a project, you're starting going, you know, the design's not done, you're starting to put it together, hey, what do we think of these image sizes? Oh yeah, that's great, and then the design comes down from the design team, and the images are different, so it's okay, we're gonna go back and reprocess those, or, or whatever. But to me, there's like kind of a bigger issue there. It's not only like during the initial development phase, it's like long term, it's like what happens when you have all this content that's been developed, all these images over time, and in, you know, 10 years from now or five years from now, you want to do a complete site overhaul and our monitors are way larger than they were five years ago and you want to have bigger images or, or whatever. It's really nice to have those original images. Uh, so that's, that's kind of another really big benefit of using something like Glide. <clears throat> and the other nice thing is you can actually let your developer or your front end developers set your sizes. So you basically just tell them how to use Glide and they just, they just update the actual URLs themselves uh, to kind of what they need. I've already mentioned you can use GD uh, or Image Magic because Glide uh, supports both of those through intervention. So here's a little bit of code how you'd actually set that up. So you can build up Glide manually and, and inject all the dependencies and everything else, but it's a little bit of work. So it comes packaged with a server factory. So server is kind of like this 
main um, object that kind of configures it, the whole thing for you. Um, so this is how you, I, I'm gonna show the server factor a whole bunch of times through this talk and I'll just show you the, the, the parameter that we're talking about each time um, to keep it simple. So driver, you just change that to ImageX, which is the PHP extension for ImageMagic. So that's how you switch it to, Image, uh, to uh, yeah, ImageMagic. So you can use any file storage as well. Is anyone here familiar with the fly system package? Yeah? Oh, okay, awesome. So that's a, that's a package. It's another PHP League package written by a guy named Frank DeYoung. It's actually his birthday today, so if you follow him on Twitter, say hi. Uh, and it's a really, really awesome package. Uh, what it does is it basically abstracts a file system away. And this was really important when I built Glide. I wanted this functionality because I didn't want people to have to use their local file systems. If you're using any sort of app that uses more than one server, saving it on your local disk just doesn't work. You need to move it to like Amazon S3 or Rackspace or whatever it is that you're using. So Fly System makes this all possible. So basically Glide is like... It's ignorant of the file system. It just uses fly system. You just pass through the, uh, the instances of uh, your fly system objects, and it just kind of knows how to work. And the other nice thing about that is if you had an edge case, some unique file system that didn't exist, you know, wasn't supported by fly, fly system, you can easily write your own adapter. I've, I've written my own adapters for, for fly system. Um, you can use Glide within your app. So this is kind of what I've mentioned already. You can use it within your normal framework request response cycle. Uh, or you can use Glide as a, its own standalone application. So I've done this myself. I'll have an, uh, maybe a larger app that I don't want my main app server to have to worry about CPU intensive image processing. So what I'll do is I'll actually just create a little you know, microservice, if you want to call it that, which is essentially just like a bootstrap file with Glide installed, and it, it does this, and it's a one, like I think I write it in about 50 lines of code, and it takes care of all the image manipulation. So it's almost like you create your own Cloud Entry or your own ImageX service, uh, but you can run it on your own system. So I'll, I'll spin that up and I'll throw it on Heroku or whatever, and it kind of just goes on its own, and I can uh, add and remove uh, instances, and that works really, really nice. And it keeps my application server not worrying about that sort of stuff. So I'll walk you through the basic setup for this. Uh, I'm going to walk you through it kind of in three steps to kind of give you a sense of how it works. So I'm going to go from 15 lines of code and get it down to three, because it doesn't need to be any more than three, but you'll see. All right. I'm hoping people in the back, can you see that more or less? A, a bit? Okay. So I'm going to just kind of walk you through each line here real quick. So this is a normal... Right. Uh, so this could be a controller or this could be a, a callback route. I'm using a callback here. Uh, so you, you'd you say, all right, um, I want to get all the images in the user directory, and I'm going to pass that through to a variable called ID. Then you're going to wire up Glide using the server factory. And you're going to say your source, so your pass, path here. So this is using local. If you only pass through strings here, which I'll expand on in a second, it'll just be the local disk. So set your cache directory as well, and then you run this output image method on the uh, Glide instance. So then what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, when you output this image, look for uh, an image in the user's directory and set it to a width of 300 and a height of 400. So this kind of shows you the process here, but this is not really how you'd use it. You could use it this way if you have that use case, but you're more likely to use it like this. So what we've done here is instead of having the actual users in the URL, we've gotten rid of that and we just said, okay, give me the path of the image. And then pass through the path as a variable into your callback or your controller. Reconfigure Glide the exact same way. Set your source and your cache folders and then output it. But at this time, what we're going to do is we're not hard coding in our path for our image or, or our image manipulation parameters. We're saying just put the path in there from the URL and put the git variables in, so the array of image manipulations right in there. So this is the whole point of Glide. You don't want to have to manually define this stuff. You want to just be able to set it using HTTP, combination of your path and your actual get variables. And then it, so now you can pass in anything you need to pass in, and it'll do the image manipulations for you. Um, you can do a little bit better than this. 
because right here it's outputting the image. So when it outputs the image, it's actually setting the headers and everything. This is a helper function that comes with Glide, but you're better off using an image response because then if you stick with an image response, it's going to work with a normal life cycle, the response and re uh, request and response cycle of your framework. Uh, and it, the framework will actually handle the outputting of the image, which is smart because if you're using any sort of middleware, um, it's a much better way of doing it as opposed to just outputting the image and, you know, dying. Um, so this is, this is a better way of doing it. So you'd use a get image response method instead. However, the trick with the get image response method is it needs to know what kind of response to return to your framework. So if you're using Symfony or you're using Laravel or you're using Cake or you're using Zend or whatever framework you're using, that response might have to be different. For example, Symfony and uh, Laravel, they use HTTP foundation, so you're going to have to return an HTTP foundation response. Uh, whereas if you're using the new version of Slim, it's using PSR7. So you have to actually tell Glide how to return those. So that's part of the configuration. I'll show you more on that in a second. So and then I would just show you here is how I actually developed this. I won't actually configure Glide right in my controller method. I'll often configure it somewhere else in a service provider, and then I'll just inject that dependency into that uh, route controller, and then I'll output it from there. And a lot of times, I obviously never use global variables. I'll use a request uh, object, an abstraction there as well. <clears throat> All right, so a little bit more about the responses. So the first version of Glide, so the current version, 0 0.3, is based on HTTP Foundation, um, which is standard with Symfony, but a lot of apps have used it. So before we had PR, PSR7, there was no real like defined way of you know, doing responses or representing responses, response and request objects in PHP. So HTTP Foundation became very popular and it was used in a lot of places, so it was kind of a natural choice for Glide. Uh, however, with my 1.0 release, I really wanted to add PSR7 because PSR7 is really going to give Glide the flexibility to, to, to return the proper responses to any application in the, in the future that follows the PSR7 interface. Uh, and this is, I've got this working, and now you can already use it with like the new version of Slim, the new version of Zend, uh, and really any other application that uses PSR7. It's kind of a, a bunch of work that you have to do on Glide. It's not a lot of work. It's actually really easy to configure, but it's, it's something that took me a little bit of work to figure out with Glide because before it was just easy. I would just outputted the response, but that really wasn't the right way to do it. But the problem is the right way to do it also requires a bit of knowledge about the framework because you want the right response objects going back. So that's why it takes a little bit of this extra configuration. So the other thing I did is I built these response objects the way that these factories get returned. I, return, I, I do, uh, built them in such a way that you can actually create your own as well. So I have adapters for all the popular frameworks, but if you happen to have your own, it would, really, it's, it would be a trivial task to create your own adapter for this. So it, it's pretty flexible that way. So here's a really quick example of how you actually configure the uh, uh, Glide to use the HTTP, HTTP Foundation response. So I call it the Symphony Response Factory. So that's a, that's a package that's available. Um, it's really, really simple. So when you create it, you pass through this in the response. You pass through this factory. I'm actually seeing here that this is uh, a bug here. I needed the word new in front of there. So it would be new uh, Symphony response factory. But that's, that's all it takes. It's one line of code, uh, but it's an important one. And then you do the same sort of thing for the PSR7 versions and whatever else. Okay, so moving along, how to use Glide with, with Amazon S3. So like I said, there's this nice abstraction layer around the file system, so you can use whatever file system you want. Uh, I'll just walk you through what that actually looks like. I would imagine S3 would be a common use case for most people. So here's what it looks like when you just do the basic install of it. If you just say source equals a string, that string will actually be translated into a, file, a fly system object and that, um, which it will assume that it's a local disk. Uh, so right now it's just set into a, a folder in the current project called path to source and path to cache. However, this is actually what's happening here. This is the exact same thing. So I'm creating a new source fly system object using the local adapter. And then I'm doing the same thing with the cache using the local adapter. And then I'm passing those objects through instead. 
So with this, you can kind of see where we would go next. Say we want to move this to Amazon S3, you would literally wire it up for Amazon S3. So there's an extra step here, and that step is you have to defi define the client. So, so the client sets your Amazon S3 key and the secret, and this is actually all fly system stuff. So if you, and you know, there's obviously good documentation for this as well. So what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, give me a new S3 client. So the actual S3 client factory there, that's part of the uh, Amazon uh, SDK. So then the a a AWS S3 adapter, so that's fly system, it just takes an instance of that client and you define your bucket as well, so where the actual images are saved. And then I just kept the cache as the local, on the local disk because a lot of times I'll just keep cache locally, but I'll get the, put the source images on S3. So kind of a point to note here is if you were to design it in this way, Glide doesn't worry about how those images get to S3. They're just there. You put them there, however, you, you know, you have some other place where users upload images, that's fine. Glide doesn't take, Glide doesn't concern itself with any of that. It just knows where to find the images. So defaults and presets, this is another new version, uh, new feature in version one. Defaults and presets make reusing image manipulations a lot easier. So here's an example. Um, of some defaults. So say we had a watermark that we wanted to be on every single image. Well, to actually pass that through every single time in the URL might be a little bit annoying. So what you can do is you can say, okay, I want for every single time an image is generated, throw this logo on it and you know, make it this width and have this much padding. Uh, and this is a really good use case I mentioned earlier for the, um, the uh, variable uh, widths um, or the, the percentage-based widths because this will automatically uh, resize it. If you have a smaller image, it'll have a smaller uh, watermark, and a larger image will have a larger watermark. So here's the other feature here, the presets. Um, same sort of idea, except a little bit different. Maybe you have, within your app, you have a whole bunch of image, standard image sizes um, that you know that you're gonna have, and you don't wanna have to type them out every time. You can actually define these presets and, and call it whatever you want. Uh, and then when you actually call the image, you would just say, P, which stands for presets, equals whatever you just defined that image uh, preset as. So in this example, we defined it as small. So you can just say P equals small. And then you can actually do this, you can actually do multiple presets at a time. So you can say, okay, I want the small one with a watermark. And you can just, by putting a comma between it, you can add more presets to it. And the other really cool thing is you can actually do additional manipulations after your presets. You'd be like, okay, I want this preset and I want that preset, but I know I want to override this particular thing or I want to add this additional manipulation to it. You can just extend that on the end of it. So it's pretty cool stuff and that kind of just helps make the, uh, the development process a little bit simpler for your front end developers, for instance, if you have kind of these standard things that you do use in your application. Another feature that's kind of good to set if you have, um, it's more of a protection mechanism than anything else. You can basically uh, minimize or reduce how large an image can be. So if you accidentally type in a thousand pixels wide, it's not gonna crash a server or timeout uh, or, or, or kill your browser or whatever. You can actually just say max image size equals 2000 pixels by 2000 pixels. So that actually works out to four million pixels, but that's you know width by height. Uh, it doesn't actually care which width or what, which height, it just says this image can't be any larger than four million pixels. So related to that, and much more important, is URL, preventing URL hijacking uh, by, signing the URL, by, by signing the image URLs. So kind of the first reaction that people have to a library like that is, well, if I can change my image manipulations using the URL, can not anybody go in there, or maybe somebody would even create uh, a malicious script that would go in and just generate 100,000 different image sizes and it would totally kill my server. And that's absolutely true if you do not sign your URLs. Um, so Glide has some fun, signing a URL is actually not that hard to do, and it's actually really, really common. If you've ever used, uh, uh, URL signing with Amazon, it's the exact same sort of uh, practice. The, the theory around it is, is you have a private key that both, um, that both you, um, the, basically that your server knows about, 
that your Glide server knows about and when you're generating the URL for it. So what happens is when you generate the URL, it creates this token. And this token is outputted with the actual uh, image URL as one of the parameters. And then when that image gets requested, the Glide server itself says, okay, let me look at that token and let me look if it matches up, if all the parameters match up. And if it does, then it shows it. But if it doesn't, then it'll just give you an error. Um, show you kind of how this gets wired up. Um, so you'd, you'd use a URL builder uh, and you'd set your URL and your key. So the key can be anything, it just has to be private. And then you generate a URL. So you'd say, builder, get me a URL. In this case, I want a cat with a width of 500. And then you'd just put that image uh, with the uh, URL in your source like you normally would. And it just all works. It takes care of the signing for you. Um, so a lot of times, because I don't want all this in my template code, I'll actually create template helpers for this. Uh, I've written one for Blade and Laravel, and I've written one for my own plates templating library. So you'd have a nice way to do this automatically with a, without a bunch of this code in your actual template code, which is definitely how you should do it. But I show it here just to give you an example of how you would do, how it actually works. So then, then this is how it actually looks. So example.com slash image slash cat.jpg. And then you can see the width equals 500 and then the token equals this long token. So that's step one. Step two is to actually tell Glide to check for that token. So, and it has helpers for this as well. It has a, a, um, the signature factory automatically will validate the request as well. So you just basically pass through your path and your get variables, or you could use your request object obviously, and it'll just verify that those things match up. And if they do, if they do great, and if they don't, it'll throw it an error. So you would put this somewhere in your uh, route cycle. So maybe you do it as a filter, like a before filter, or you'd put it right in line with your actual, uh, in, your, in your controller itself. It just needs to be in there somewhere. It could be done as a middleware, whatever you want. So if you're gonna use Glide, this is a really important step. It's a little bit confusing at first, but you really should not even consider using Glide if you're not gonna sign your, or sign your images. Otherwise, you're just leaving yourself exposed. And maybe you won't get burned, you probably won't, but it's just not a very smart way of doing it because if anybody ever figures it out, they can burn you. Disabling cache. So uh, this is something that I get asked about once in a while. Some people want to, five minutes? Nope, one minute. One minute, okay. Uh, then I'll go really quickly. One minute, disabling cache, something that some people ask about once in a while because they want to use varnish instead. Glide, you can disable the cache and let varnish or whatever other caching mechanism uh, be used instead. Uh, and the other thing I was gonna talk about is pre-processing images. Sometimes this is helpful in like heavier environments. Uh, you can use Glide with like a queuing system to pre-cache popular sizes, but I'll leave that for today. That's kind of a value add. I'll throw the, slide, the slides up on uh, uh, joined, joined in so that you can find those. So that's all I have. Thanks for coming to my talk, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan.